of 2012 when folks just kind of came in to learn what, what's a STEM hub about, and we thought it was time that we start getting together on a regular basis around some topics of interest. And um, one of the topics that has burbled up a lot in my work over the last nine months is this concept of physics first. Um, it's, it's a course progression that's being utilized here at the LNN STEM Academy. Um, as well as another school here in Knox County, and um, there's a lot of interest around it in the whys and the hows. So we tried to assemble um, some experts, or at least some folks with some in-the-field experience around this. We are testing out new video recording equipment this morning. Um, so the slides and the speakers, all of this content will be archived. For the speakers, if you're in front of the slides, it may be a problem for the audience here, but it won't be a problem for the viewing audience later because the recording will be on a split screen where they'll be able to see that information. But we've got some websites and some contact information on the slides, and again, I'll make that available to you um, as soon as I can after today. So if you want to go back and reference it again um, or share it with your colleagues, you can do that. We want this to be very informal, so please feel free to jump in, to ask questions. No question is too large or too small. We've got a great gathering this morning. We have um, everybody from um, higher ed, classroom teachers, um, administrators, Administrators, Board of Education, um, we've, got, we've got a great mix of perspectives. So everybody's coming at this um, conversation from a different angle, and I think that will make for a lively discussion. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Stuart Elson, a physics professor at the University of Tennessee, and he has graciously agreed to come and kind of lay the foundation. We know some folks um, are coming at this brand new, so we're going to begin at the beginning. What is it? And um, why is it our topic of conversation? Dr. Elston, thank, okay, thank you. So um, in way of further introduction, I should say that um, I teach a introductory course in calculus-based physics at the University of Tennessee. It's a, sort of a standard course taken by science majors, math majors, computer <coughs> science students. So I get the product of your efforts. Uh, at least those of you who are in the uh, secondary education arena. Um, and uh, I guess that gives me some perspective on uh, physics curricula. Uh, so the topic today is physics first. And um, the first thing to understand about physics first, for those of you who may be coming at this new, is that it's not just about physics. It's actually an approach to science curriculum, or curricula, in um, high schools, uh, and it's a what's sometimes called an inverted curriculum. You sometimes hear that uh, language used. So um, back around the early 1900s, the traditional way of teaching science in high school was to teach biology, chemistry, and then physics. Some people uh, joke that that's because it's in alphabetical order, <laughs> um, but it actually makes sense in a way because. Uh, biology is less mathematically challenging than is chemistry, and uh, physics is, of course, the most challenging. And the rationale was that that gives students an uh, opportunity to learn some mathematics before they jump into physics. <clears throat> but um, more recently, perhaps within the last perhaps 20 years, uh, there has been interest in inverting that sequence to start with physics, move to chemistry, then to uh, biology, and possibly then a second course in physics at a more uh, traditional level as far as high school physics is concerned. And the um, rationale or the argument behind that is that since the early 1900s when the original sequence was uh, devised and standardized, um, we have learned that Quantum physics, you know, is the basis of chemistry, and chemistry through uh, molecular biology is in some sense the basis of biology. And so it makes more sense, perhaps, to teach it in that inverted order, physics, chemistry, and then biology. So there's more, a lot more you could say about that, but that's the basic theory. And then, of course, there's practice. And so today, I guess, we are going to examine how that inverted curriculum is uh, actually implemented in Knox County schools anyway, 
perhaps some of you are also doing this in other districts. Um, and um, I had some involvement with Physics First, perhaps I think it was 13 years ago now, and it died because of funding issues and because nobody knew about this. Uh, we were, as uh, Rudy was told me earlier, uh, sort of working in isolation and, and um, uh, there were, as I said, funding issues and the whole effort just sort of died. And I've been away from it for a while. So if, uh, as we kick off this discussion, um, um, having people from uh, the LNN STEM Academy and Hardin Valley Academy discuss their practice in implementing a form of physics first curriculum, um, if that uh, discussion sort of wanes, I have lots of stupid questions to ask. Because uh, as I say, I've been away from this for a while. So I'm not sure who would like to uh, jump in first. Uh, I understand Frank would and um, Nick will see. And uh, Rudy Furman are involved in actually delivering physics first curricula. So perhaps we can ask them to share with us what they actually do, what's actually in the course that they teach. Uh, and what issues they faced in implementing that. Um, I have questions about how they address the issue of depth versus breadth, which is becoming um, an issue as well. So I'll sit up here often. Perfect. Yeah, we may have questions for you um, as well. So um, I have the HVA slides next. This will probably completely turn our recording upside down. But um, anyway, um, Frank needs to get back downstairs with his AP Physics class, I understand. So we'll plug, plug them in right now and, and then um, move forward. So we, at the beginning, I was supposed to say thank you to our sponsor. So let's put the commercial in right now. Thank you to our sponsor, Messer Construction, who provided this video recording equipment. And um, we're so grateful for their, their contribution to make this possible. Um, if you guys would just introduce yourselves and what you do at the LNN and, and HVA, and um, we'll let you all tell a little bit about what you do. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Wilsey. I teach um, Physical World Concepts, which is the Physics First Freshman Physics that we teach here, uh, as well as Algebra 1 and um, the STEM course uh, here at the LNN STEM Academy. This is my first year as an actual teacher. Last year, I interned here in the uh, Teach Here program. I'm Frank Wood. I, I teach uh, Physics for Freshmen. Uh, it's uh, the course was designed around honors, physical world concepts, but it is, uh, but I can give, if the student has already had algebra, I can give them a fully compliant uh, physics course for, you know, a general physics course for them. I also teach AP Physics and, uh, and also an, an engineering course we call STEM2 Engineering, and uh, I coach the robotics team. Uh, my name is Rudy Furman. I uh, say I teach more like bird freshmen, um, <laughs> like cats, uh, the Physics First PwC class on both honors and standard CP students, and then every once in a while they let me teach a teacher. So I'm totally losing my mind. <laughs> so um, maybe, I don't know, maybe Frank and, and Nick share a little bit as um, the Ellen and STEM Academy was, was being created and stood up, of course, this is only the second year for the LNN STEM Academy, so um, the, the school began with freshmen and sophomores, and another freshman class was added this year, so the school has freshmen, sophomores, and juniors this year. But um, Frank, you were around when, this, when the original curriculum was being created. Talk a little bit about that discussion. Was there any conversation about which way to go in terms of the course progression, and um, how did you end up in this place here? Wow. Um, okay. Uh, the, there really wasn't a whole lot of discussion because there was a general agreement that we were going to be doing a physics first curriculum um, just on the onset. Um, I was brought into the equation with that idea in mind. So there wasn't any real discussion about it because uh, I had talked with the uh, princ now principal, former uh, science uh, chairperson for the county uh, and um, science supervisor. And so I 
you know, that was kind of a done deal. We were going to do physics first, and we'd already done all the pre-work before that. And uh, and the and we taught the two different levels. Last year, we had uh, I taught every student last year, uh, and uh, it was uh, the regular the the PWC <coughs> kids, which are uh, not, they haven't had algebra yet, but they're taking it then, and then. In theory, uh, it was the uh, honors physical world concepts kids that, it, in in theory, I say, uh, had had taken algebra. Unfortunately, a few uh, non-algebra mm -hmm. students got mixed into it, so it was a lot of different levels. So I think yeah. that's covered most of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Rudy, were you at HVA when the school was, was started a few years back? And what was that conversation like? <clears throat> I was. I, I've been there since 2008. And I was hired on um, with the whole premise, uh, my certifications in chemistry, for me to teach this freshman um, intro level um, class using the modeling method for instruction. Uh, so that was never, I signed on to do it. I wasn't uh, necessarily, you know, told I was going to do it, so I was obviously on board, glad to work with an administrative staff that supported this um, endeavor, and Frank actually spent a, two years or one year? Two years. So he was with us at Hard Valley for two years, um, helping us get this thing rolling and going, um, and then he took an opportunity here, and I think that's why he says when it was a no-brainer, um, uh, the principal here, Ms. Ash, was... Um, overseeing some of the construction and things that were going on at Hardin Valley when it started and then when they designed to start this school she took it over so I think that's what he's talking about there's a no-brainer because she was kind of spearheaded against us starting it at Hardin Valley and then she moved over here so it was kind of it never was in question they were always going to do it um, but lots of resistance at first um, but very helpful that the administration has stood behind us 100% in what we're doing um, and gives us room to um, instruct as we see fit. Not have, not all the teachers use modeling, uh, so that's been a different issue for us to attack with it. But, um, Talk about that resistance, um, Rudy. Was, has it been from parents or from students or other teachers in the, in the system in the county? Or? Both um, and all three. Uh, the parents resist because that's not the way it was done when they were in school. Um, the students resist because well, my friends at such and such school aren't doing it this way. They're taking biology. Why well, don't I have to take this class? The other teachers in the building, I don't think they're necessarily in resistance in the building, but across the county, they're like, well, why are you all doing it this way? Um, just to be different, or is there a reason? Um, once you explain the reason, most teachers say they agree with the reasoning. However, I wouldn't want it that way. Uh, and it's not until you get into it, and Ms. Sayers can talk a little bit about that when she gets up here, because she... She gets them after I'm done with them. Um, and even on up the ladder into biology their junior years, um, now those teachers are telling us we wouldn't want it any other way. This is the way we want it. Um, that the kids in biology are ready for it. Um, the biggest hurdle to overcome is, as Frank said, one of the biggest things we've seen is the math. Um, it is important to identify if the kids have had the math or if they've not had the math. They can still take the course without the math but they need some basic algebra concepts um, that I don't think are too difficult to share with them um, without using any hard, core, hard numbers and facts um, as far as the, the math to support it. But if they've had the math, as Frank said, you can get them to a physics credit with the algebra. Um, and just supplementing a little bit um, geometry, tree, and algebra too, um, as they need it. Um, and those kids that can do it in the honors classes are ready for it. And they've already had it. And some of them are concurrently in geometry while taking this freshman honors physics class. Go ahead. So, so do you get any uh, pushback from math teachers that, you know, you're teaching math? No, again, you know, I think Hard Valley is a unique situation when it opened. And, and everybody that comes in, this is just kind of what we do. Uh, and the math teachers are on board. As a matter of fact, there's lots of discussions between math teachers and science teachers, more so than any other school I was ever a, a part of, um, in terms of how do you teach this, or, hey, 
next time you teach this, can you use this verbiage or can you insert this example for them? And a lot of the math teachers are very receptive to that because they want to give, as we all know, part of our evaluations is real life connections. They, they, they want and need those. Um, a lot of times math teachers, I'll be grading something in the workroom, which is another thing that you know, we're at Hard Valley. If we have workrooms, we'll have our own classrooms. So when we go to grade, we go to a common room, and teachers just are all in their all disciplines, and the math teachers say, hey, I just taught that. I'm going, I don't know. My kids tell me, you know, they, they talk to us. So they, you're able to play off the math that they've had, and the math teachers seem appreciative that what they're teaching the kids is getting used somewhere else. Um, Nick, I want you to have a chance to jump in, and I, I think one of the questions that I've heard around the region is, um, if the school system is looking at changing the course progression, um, what do you do with the kids that have already started with biology first? And I know you were here last year when the school opened, and you had freshmen and sophomores. What happened with the sophomores who came to um, Ellen and Sam Academy who had biology as freshmen at their base school? Um, I'm not quite sure about that. I'm not sure. Like I'm in. The, I asked you a hard question. I didn't know. <laughs> I, 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 I just knew you were here. I could address this. this yeah, go ahead. Here. Sure. I am um, a physics teacher and an algebra one teacher, and I agree 100 percent with what you're saying. As far as uh, I think that the um, the physics first that um, that that demands in a lot of ways that there's a, a, a lot more collaboration between. The math teachers and the science teachers, and that that's definitely a positive thing. Um, and for some students, I'm actually their algebra teacher and their physics teacher, and I think that's extremely powerful. Being able to support the algebra with um, physics connections and vice versa. Um, so, as yeah, far as your right. question, though, I'm right. not sure how to address that. Frank, what did you all do about that? Um, well, we we put them in the the physics first class, we, we just, I mean, they, it just means they're a little bit out of sequence. Um, we didn't put them in the chemistry, we put them in, in physics. So we put them in the honors physical world concepts and differentiated the instruction enough that, uh, that they would be capable of getting a physics credit and, uh, and, you know, basically that. I mean, they were sophomores in a freshman class, but um, you know, if you differentiate it, uh, instruction, you can, you can put them all together. And it wasn't really a problem. Is this a good time to see if we have um, questions from our, our group? Um, so, Frank, you're talking about uh, the two levels that you have with this physics world versus the honors level where kids have already had algebra and the regular level where they're currently in algebra, mm -hmm. um, you all probably don't have, but some of us do have kids that as freshmen are still not in algebra. They're in some kind of workshop or something mm -hmm. like that, math workshop. We do those kids. We, we still, we have every, every bit of the range because we, we have a lottery of schools. So it's not by grades they get in here. There's no entrance exam. They, they uh, vote, and sometimes it's not them, it's their parents that vote that they want to put them in here. So, um, so we get, we've had, um, you know, the lowest level uh, child that has significant trouble with algebra, and they're in the regular physical world concepts class. And, uh, um, and you know, and, you know, I think we, we started with something, we had a, you know, um, unfortunately with a small faculty, if one becomes a coach for something, uh, a core coach for something in another area, you know, it can kind of decimate your math department. And we had that happen. We had another program where we we're going to try to merge math and physics together. And um, we had some great ideas, and we did some lessons together that first year. But, um, you know, one of the key people left, and uh, Nick really did a great job of trying to merge them. But he's, he's done... Um, He's done the next best thing right now. He's done everything he can. He is really, he's teaching an awful lot of math in the, phys, the physical world concept class so that those kids are getting kind of a double math class in algebra. So he can provide, I'm sorry, let's see, we'll talk, with, uh, we'll, let's see, we make your mouth go. Uh, he's doing a great job uh, on, um, 
on, on giving these kids good fundamental examples of how you can use this. And it seems like the more contextual you get, the better it actually works. So maybe it improves their algebra and later on. Yes, and that's what we're hopeful. And seeing as how uh, the, the sciences are now uh, basically uh, reviewed based on the mass scores, we're all for that. You know, we want to improve that algebra outcome. You know, you kind of do what you get paid for. So that's we do it a little bit differently. Um, and I'm not sure how what level of student that you're talking about don't come in with algebra, um, but I'm speaking of uh, you know special ed type students that really struggle with math concepts in general. Maybe aren't even really on grade level. Um, those kids we put in ecology. So we put them in a non-math class. Um, you know, kind of our thinking and our feeling was to try to get these kids to be successful in the science course. They still have to take chemistry. They still have to take biology. Um, but if they're not strong, strong math students, then we don't try to. Um, and it's a very small population. And Sarah, like there's one, one class, maybe two, maybe two classes. classes a year that are, that okay. are in yeah. this boat. Um, as far as... <clears throat> what we did the first year, because we opened, we had freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. So we had our entire science department was upside down for about three years. Um, two for sure. In the third year, we were starting to come out of the haze. But we had freshmen in biology. Or no, we didn't have, never had freshmen in biology. But we had sophomores in biology, then we had juniors in biology, and then the next year we had seniors in biology. And we just kind of had biology. Um, and we put you in when we could. Um, but we tried to keep those freshmen on track. <clears throat> so they never really took a class with biology with the juniors and the seniors that did, weren't in the physics first. So we tried to keep the, that cohort of kids together and let them start the progression. And the other two grades, we just kind of said, well, we kind of piecemeal them. This is what you need. This is how we get your credit. We taught a lot of physical science um, to get that extra lab credit for some of those students that had already had or in biology, I've already had this, or this, so. But now we don't, we don't teach but maybe one per semester physical science. We have 1,800 kids in our building, so. Um, we took a little different approach, um, but I still have, you know, special ed students in my CP class. The ones that can handle the math, um, for the most part, the majority of our students that are either concurrently enrolled in algebra or have already had it are the ones we're putting in PWC. The ones that are still taking a bridge or fundamental or a some sort of a um, alternate math class we're putting in ecology. I'm curious. Overall, how many science courses for high school students do you offer at your schools? A rough estimate. Probably 15, maybe 16 different okay. science courses. I want to get Debbie okay. up here. We are tight on space, but I want you to get up here. Debbie is from Hardin Valley, and she is uh, a be part of this discussion as well. So come on up, because we've got some unique insight as well. Is, is, do you mean courses from the perspective of course descriptions or actual what in college would be called sections of courses? No, that would be courses in terms of course descriptions with a different course code. So how, how many sections? In, in chemistry, for example, um, we will have six sections of honors chemistry one. We will have nine to ten sections of standard chemistry. And we have maybe four sections of year-long chemistry, which is really environmental chemistry. We just happen to call it year-long. But you have to remember we have, you know, 1,800, 1,900 students, and all students are supposed to take chemistry. So if we get the same kind of information about physical world concepts, I guess. It's and about the same as far as the number of classes. I would say there's probably, see, I had three honors classes in the, we don't, we don't, we term, usually only teach one honors class in the spring. And all of our honors classes for PwC are in the fall, catching all those kids that have already had the algebra. We want to get them now. And then the kids that haven't had, so another one of the ways we, we even hold off on standard PwC, the college placement kids, the, uh, and let them get another semester of high school 
maybe they're going to take it to the map then, and then we can capture some more of it. So traditionally, we'll do in this in the fall will be honors, all honors. So maybe six or seven sections, and then in the spring we'll have maybe eight sections of standard and one section of honors. But they're number number wise are very simple. I mean, they're right there on. It may be one in college. Another question. I just asked that because in context, you know, y'all have the leeway to have students go into other areas and take other courses, whereas a lot of teachers don't. You know, for example, we offer physics, chemistry one and two, biology, and depending on the school, one course in ecology, one course in earth science. So, and our requirements are such that our physics classes have to be occupied by almost every student in the county. Now the requirements for them to take so many sciences, and it's very difficult. I've, I've got one question for everybody here. Has anybody here ever gone to the ASU Arizona State Modeling? Um, well, we, yeah, we, 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 they, we didn't go to Arizona, but we would. But to their modeling, it, yeah. I believe it's probably quite worthwhile. I yeah. think it, it was a eye-opening and groundbreaking piece to my instructional method. Okay, thanks. I teach modeling also. I mean, it's just, it's a fact of life. That's just a, a method of instruction. Mm -hmm. It's in your tool bag, we but, use it. Yeah, and it's what scientists actually do. Right. So, you I think one of the Did you go to the MTSU uh, offering of modeling? I went to the one in Birmingham. Birmingham. Um, in 2008, that was part of me signing away my life. I had to go to that. <laughs> that hired me and said, oh, by the way, next week you have to go to Birmingham for two weeks. Um, so I got, you know, splashed into the pond rather quickly. Um, Does somebody want to give a framework for what, what this is in case there are folks in the room that don't know what this is about? The modeling and the Arizona, Dr. Elson, you would talk about that? Uh, well, Arizona State University for the last 20 years, I think, has been offering a um, a program that they call Modeling Instruction. It's one of two programs nationwide that has received a uh, designation of an exemplary science curriculum uh, by the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education. Uh, it's based on the idea that what scientists actually do in the real world is construct models, usually uh, mathematical models, but also conceptual models of the phenomena that they you know, are um, concerned with. Uh, and it's uh, been very popular in some areas, not so much in Tennessee, I'd say, so far. Uh, I tried offering uh, one, of the, one of their workshops using, um, there was a teacher who was trained in it at the web school, uh, his name was Ellis Knoll. And um, I used him as um, a you know, a uh, instructor, and uh, had a small grant from in the days of Eisenhower grants, and um, we could get very little, very few people to participate in it. We were funded for 20 teachers, and I had to really, really struggle to get uh, eight to participate. Uh, so it's, it was yeah. so. Any, anyway, um, it's uh, been very successful where it's been. Uh, Embrace. It's a, it's a great program. I, um, I the I, the methods I use in teaching the course, the intro course at UT that I teach, is has borrowed a number of the features of that program, and it works really really well, especially for what some people call the flipped classroom. You know, where you throw much more responsibility for the learning on the students. It works great for that um, scenario. And I apologize that we didn't get Debbie up here to give you a tight on space with our new video recording equipment here. But I've changed the slide to Hardin Valley. And um, George Ash, who is the assistant principal for the STEM Academy portion of Hardin Valley Academy, was not able to join us this morning. But we're so pleased to have Debbie Sayers here, who's dean of the STEM Academy. And maybe you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your history with the school and what you see as a chemistry teacher and your observations. Um, I do teach chemistry. I, the, I started at Hardin Valley the year it opened, so 2008, and I taught um, one or two sections of PWC, 
So every single one of our teachers, chemistry, biology, or physics certified that first year taught a section. Um, and I think that has been very beneficial in terms of understanding what the curriculum is. So as a teacher who receives those students, I know what they've learned, I know what they've been taught, so I know what I can hold them accountable for. Um, I teach Honors Chemistry 1, and then I also teach AP Chemistry, and then I'm also responsible for um, the, our senior out-of-school experience, which is more of a capstone project. We call it Senior Portfolio. And I think one of the benefits of PwC, the Physics First, is it exposes the students to like science that they can see and they can touch. And what it does is it piques their interest toward the sciences that they can't view without the assistance of like a microscope um, or like chemistry, which you can't see at all um, in terms of what's going on. And so when I taught that freshman course, they were asking all sorts of questions about things that they would learn later in chemistry and biology. And it was really neat to be able to say, okay, when you're a sophomore, you're going to learn that in chemistry. And I'm um, certified chemistry and I'm also certified biology, so I know what is taught in both of those courses. And so they would ask a question and I would say, well, you're going to get that when you're a junior. And so I think what it did is it builds interest in those upper level science courses. And so one of the things that we have seen at Hard Valley is these kids are taking so many more science courses than are required for graduation. Like, you know, in the state of Tennessee, they only have to have three science credits. And we are having many of our students, this would be honors NCP, that graduate with five, six, we, um, there's several students this year who will be graduating with nine science credits. Um, and I think PwC... Not all those nine are honors students. Yeah. Some of them are CPs that they just love science. So I think PwC mm -hmm. lends itself to that because it kind of opens their eyes to a science that they do not typically take. I have a question about those upper level science classes. Um, so I'm particularly thinking about the physics B redesign, where that's going to end up taking, you know, I think in most scenarios, two, two chunks. How do you root them from a uh, physics, chemistry, biology into, do they have to go, where do you start doubling them up, where they're taking like an AP physics one, or how do you all plan? It to depends on the students. I mean, we, we typically encourage them <coughs> to double up during the sophomore year. Um, but we have, especially our honors students who have had algebra in eighth grade, um, and so they are taking the honors PWC course in the fall, they can take chemistry as freshmen. So they could do that in the spring. Small number do um, that. Very small number do that. Teacher recommended. They, don't, they can't just say, I want to take my, it had, I mean, we're talking about the top ones in the honors PWC classes that we would say, okay. You're ready for it. You can go. And the vast majority of them, what they'll do is they'll take chemistry um, fall of their sophomore year, biology spring of their junior year. The other thing that we allow them to do is the biology one course can also be taken during their junior year while they are simultaneously taking AP chemistry, which is two semesters long, or um, any of the physics which ends up being two semesters long because that's different enough that um, they don't need, it's not like they need to take, um, they would have to have biology one before they would go into AP biology, which is also taught as a two semester. So you let them go straight from PWC into AP Physics C or they have to take the course? No, they would have to yeah. take chemistry before they would be able to go into B or C. But once they've taken chemistry, they can go into B or they can go into C. Now with the redesign, I don't teach AP Physics, so Frank, maybe you can speak to that. Well, um, now, I've been doing it a little unconventionally, although I believe you guys at Oak Ridge do, you let them come in without physics credit at all and take B? Okay, well, um, 
up to this point in time, we haven't really seen the, the impact of what PwC will have on that. But um, I think they'd easily go into C. Uh, they'd easily be able to go and get into AP Physics C. But the redesign, maybe, uh, maybe a, oh, okay, if they were an honor student freshman year and got the physics credit, then they'd have no problem with AP Physics C later on. But if they're a, um, a standard student, then probably B would be a better choice for them, or if they were in the low end of the, so, you know, they would get, it would be a more gradual slope for them. Are you as far as the redesign. one and two together, or? Well, uh, I'm not really sure how we're going to do that. I mean, uh, I don't sure think anybody is. Uh, no, that's, a, that's a hotbed discussion yeah. for us, too. That's yeah. trying to figure out how that's going to. We, we go, uh, we're, we run our courses the entire year. So, uh, so you could you could actually go five days a week and run them together, uh, and and take care of B that way. Um, C you could also, but at this point in time, we're talking about only um, doing mechanics, AP Physics C mechanics, mm -hmm. and just you know run the entire year with our regular schedule with AP Physics C mechanics because the 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 wow. number of students that have calculus is fairly low at this point. It's two, so <laughs> uh, so we we just move on from there. Could you? I'm a little confused. Are y'all on block scheduling? And you mentioned go you know, five days a week would be different. So you're not. Yeah, I'm confused. We uh, we work on a, a kind of an A B schedule. Uh, we call it L and N. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, never figured that out. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, um, you know, it's an every other day, and Fridays, you know, get, you know, the, let's see, whatever, whatever schedule starts the week, you know, this week, uh, the N part, start of the week, so Friday will be an N day, and then next week, Friday will be an L day, so it's every other day block schedule. It works really well, I think, uh, because it gives some wait time. You know, you give them a heavy-duty concept, and yes, there's a little bit of reteaching at the beginning, but it, oh, you know, they get some concepts a lot better. I actually, this year, I have gone much faster than I've ever gone before. I mean, and the kids are just eating it right up. So um, we're we're going to finish ahead of time. Uh, and have plenty of time for maybe even a project, or we're going to do an acoustics. And project. are your are your class times longer? No. Like, they're just block schedule times. Well, well, but that is that is longer that's to me. That's not. Oh, okay. it's, it's a it's a ninety minute class as opposed to a. It's a ninety minute okay. class. So we have two. We have many different models going on up here. So the Ellen and STEM Academy, when it was was stood up, um, the the faculty and, and Mrs. Ash, who's joined us, thank you for being here, Mrs. Ash, um, came up with a modified block schedule. So um, it, it has that longer time period, but it's an A-B rotation, so that um, the the class lasts all year rather than just a semester. And Debbie, do you want to speak for those that are from different parts of the region, how Knox, how you do it at Harden Valley? We are on 80 minute blocks. So it's a four by four, um, but it's 80 minutes rather than 90 minutes because we have um, a special period every day that we call extension. But you, your your students finish a course in, in, a, one, in, a, in semester. one semester, and they take it five days a week. At the Ellen and STEM Academy, they take it every other day with a block period, and it takes a whole year to finish the course. So when you're talking about doubling up, because um, we I, I'm at Webb, and we have many students who double up. But it's it's within a, what I would call a, a traditional schedule. Thank you. Um, so when you're talking about doubling up, do you have them do is doubling up one a fall and one a spring, or both a fall? Um, when I talked about taking PWC and chemistry, that would be fall and spring, mm -hmm. or taking chemistry and biology, that would be fall and spring. Um, when I talked about taking biology concurrently with an AP course, whether that was AP chemistry, AP physics, AP biology, which I wouldn't recommend the AP biology with biology, 
that would be in the same semester. That makes more sense. It depends on the class combination that you're looking at, whether or not right. it's concurrent or if they're back-to-back -back semesters. But right. We call both of them doubling up. I think we just understand what semester. The teachers understand which semesters are back-to-back -back or same semester. We, right. we tell the kids when to do that. And uh, Rudy, you made a great slide for us that, that kind of has an outline of, of your PWC. Um, there it is. No. Yes, um, your PWC curriculum. Do you want to talk about that a little bit so folks um, understand? Right, so modeling is on the left, and, and then um, he, Dr. Elson talked about the flipped classroom, which I've also picked up from uh, Glenn Arnold, who teaches here. So mm -hmm. he's really the guru that I pick it up from, and then um, so I have been using it. But modeling starts out with um, a, an initial experiment. So the first day of, any, of a new unit, we do something. We go collect data, we bring the data back to the classroom, um, and then we analyze it. We graph it, is there any graphical representations of the variables, do they have anything to do with one another, or is it just a random scatter plot with no correlation? Of course, all the variables have a correlation. As you see, it's the instructor sets the context, so I pick the variables that we're going to test. Um, but I'll let, I, we do it in a class. We say, what can we measure? Okay, this is what I want to measure. So kind of how um, a, a scientist will go about setting up an experiment. What is it that I want to test? Uh, we analyze it. We try to uh, find a graphical fit uh, to develop an equation. Um, then we're going to validate that. So we're going to go look. We're going to compare it to something real world to see if, we were, if what we got matches what somebody else got. So we're trying to reprove or re-verify somebody else's data numbers. Um, and a lot of times we'll do this with whiteboarding, which is just a technique that's used in modeling where the students would get up and explain their results and answers and what kind of sense can they make of it, um, which you have to teach them how to do because they have no idea how to do it. Um, and then you end up with a deploy. And deploy is, so the first part may take two or three class periods, depending on your length, and then the deploy is the rest of it. It's, it's applying the model they've designed to how many ever different situations you come up with. And they think that every situation is different from the last one. Even though I'm sitting there thinking, well, this is just like that one. I just changed the words or the numbers or the people that are in it. Um, but just to get them to describe, explain, predict, control. Um, and if you have time, they can design a, a follow-up experiment to see, well, we want to change something. How does that affect it? Um, but you would do that. And what I found was that modeling slows down not instruction, but it slows down your pacing. So you have to be careful on how much time you're spending on the development. Uh, we use a lot of the Logger Pro uh, Vernier equipment. Um, later on, we start out doing hands-on physical data collection, physical graphing, so they understand how, how it works. And then we move um, into using digital sensors that help us collect data and analyze very quickly um, so we can kind of compress that. But then I found Flip Classroom, which is better because a lot of the instructional, boring lecture stuff can be done at home. Um, and then now the task is trying to get them to do it. The honors kids do it. They don't have a big deal with it. The CP kids struggle a little bit more. But I think it's just more that it's the shift of the responsibility to the student, which they don't like. So it's, it's not a, it doesn't work for them. As far as I can't get the technology to work to watch a video at home, I mean, I'm talking about all levels of learning, CP students. They come in early, watch a video, stay late, watch a video. I'll let them watch them during class, whenever we can get it. Their friend has a phone. I said, watch it on your friend's phone. I don't care. Um, Talk about what Flip Classroom is, just in case there's folks in the building that don't use so that. So Flip Classroom is taking the traditional classroom instruction and placing it at home, either them watching a PowerPoint or watching a video maybe that um, you've designed um, using some a uh, fairly rudimentary um, apparatus for about, what Debbie would you say, about $150 mm -hmm. you can do. Um, and that, you know, and our bookkeepers allowed us to use BEP money for that stuff for instructional. Um, and then basically recording your own lecture, you need to be 10 minutes-ish is a long one. If I give them a nine-minute video to watch, they really complain. I'm going, it's nine minutes out of your night. You'll be okay. You would have spent longer than that staring at a problem you weren't going to do. Um, and then I usually give them a uh, survey. They have to follow along. It's kind of like guided notes, just to make sure that they're watching the video. Um, and then that gives more time in class for us to actually do something instead of me standing up there 
what we would call traditional teaching and lecturing. It's more activity. And how does what we heard or saw last night relate to what you're physically doing right now in the classroom? At least it gets more time for questions. I can walk around the room and help kids. Students that are really struggling with the content may have been absent for a couple of days, um, get them caught up. Um, and I think it's just a a uh, culture thing. I think, you know, if the kids understand that this is what we're going to do, then this is what we're going to do. Some of them still won't watch it. It doesn't matter what you do. They're not going to do their homework at all. Well, not a question, just a statement. I, I use flipped classroom. I'm yep. a biology teacher, but um, I use the flipped classroom. And one of the things that I found... I know this is a physics discussion, but I'm going to interject some little biology. But uh, one of the things that I've found with my students, be they CP or honors, is that they can pause me mm -hmm. and um, take their notes as long as they need to. Take us, go back and review it. They can, you know, laugh at my jokes again. Um, they also have those to review for the test, for the exam. To um, I found it very beneficial. You do have to be careful, though. I have to tell them you cannot share me on social media, and you're not allowed to make fun of my accent. And you know, but, but I, many of my struggling students have really, really benefited from the flip classroom. Um, when you have kids who are out for extended periods of time because of mono, they can still do it at home. They can still get the lectures at home, and it's not as much of a problem with them not being in school. I have a slightly different version I use on FLIP. I use it for extremely complex problems, like a projectile problem or something else. And I go ahead and do the, the flipped version of it so they can do the same thing. They can pause it. They can look back. You know, when they're, when they're trying to do a complex problem, at least they've got something to compare it to. And then they can work through it and then realize that what they're doing is not that much different from what they I've got to interject here as a distance teacher, whether y'all know or not. I teach I teach Morgan County through a distance system, Sandberg video teleconferencing. And I do it mostly for economic reasons. We don't have the teachers or the resources up there. So I teach four colleges, chemistry for one block and physics for one block. Dr. Yeah. Warren, let's bring you up because you're you're part of the program too, and this is a great well, great time to get you up here because I think some folks are going to have questions. We can actually bring another chair up here. Or I yeah. sit here. Perfect, right there is perfect. We'll get your slide up. Um, um, oh, I don't need a slide. Do I have a slide? I might have made you a slide if I got there. I don't know. Oh, well, it's pretty anyway. Go ahead. Well, anyway, one of the Few of my students that really care are finding that having the recordings, that the classes are recording, is sort of like y'all are talking about. They have something to go to outside of class or at home. I'd say 90% of them don't use it, but stay at homes, have to stay at homes, uh, illnesses, people that miss because of other reasons. Now, these students all find that it's pretty useful to go back. But I do like the idea of I call it canning, just one simple idea or concept that you're working with into a short pre-recorded lesson. And I'm, this is giving me ideas, so I have to talk to the Tanberg people and PCS, I think, out in Louisville, whether this can be done. But my students' main problem is they don't have the bandwidth or the connections at home to do this. They have to be at school. Usually they have to be at school to use the school's facilities. Otherwise, I tell them, if you've got a slow connection, you're going to have to download the whole video if you really want to play back and forth. You know, I don't know. I suppose y'all are online and they stream, or can they right. download them? I can get mine both. You do both. You know. Okay. I always attach a stream link for them um, on YouTube. I upload them to YouTube. I have my own channel and watch them there. Um, or I also upload the actual video for them for those that have the bandwidth issue. We have our own site that's provided by Tanberg that holds all of our recordings. And I also teach sometimes Granger County, but they don't have a physics teacher either. So, um, yeah, before we get in, into that dialogue, I think 
uh, I know here at the LNN at least there are students who don't have access to um, internet at home at all or they don't have high-speed internet and you all they can download the content at home if they have their because here they have their own device and they can take that device home with them and watch it um, but in rural school systems where, where um, students might not have their own device, I think you said, Rudy, and, and Debbie, sometimes they come to school and watch it in the morning. They can watch the it, library, they can watch it. Watch in the library. I've also heard teachers putting on a CD. Mm -hmm. like the flash drive. Yeah, flash. flash. Typically, the kids that don't have internet access at home also don't have a computer. That's probably why they don't have internet. They probably don't have access to a computer. So I find it's more a physical machine issue than it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we wanted Dr. Warren to um, to join us as well. He um, is delivering physics in a, a really unique manner um, that we've talked a lot about it at STEM Spark. Um, his school system, Morgan County, and I'll let him introduce himself um, in a moment, is not doing the physics first course sequence, but they are um, delivering physics content virtually. And so they are reaching students in Morgan County and high schools that don't have a physics teacher, as well as students in, in Granger County. And it has come with some challenges, but um, is, is another model to, to look at, um, thinking about our, across our region, knowing that we just don't have enough physics teachers. Um, coming out of our, our schools and um, how can we leverage the talent that we do have. And so, Dr. Warren, if you would maybe tell a little bit about how you got to your teaching position. Now I know you a little were at the lab first and tell us what you do. I have a PhD in chemistry at the University of, well, no, Iowa State University, sorry. Got my bachelor's at UT. And uh, five years ago, six years ago, I was talked into changing careers in teaching by folks that I went to church with. And it seemed like a good idea to me. It's been really exciting. I teach chemistry and physics. Uh, two of our schools, we have four schools in our district, two of them don't have chemistry teachers or physics teachers. So they totally depend on the distance classes. And two of the high schools have chemistry teachers, but there are no physics teachers except me. I'm in an unusual position in that they put me at the vocational school. This is really weird, mm -hmm. actually. But they did it so that students could be, they automatically have buses running there. You know, schools there don't have their own vocational school. They all have to come to the central school. Well, physics students and chemistry students were assumed they would get on the bus and go. But what really happened was is they just, they didn't want, a lot of them did not want to go either get on the bus or the reputation of this or that. And so we got a grant for the distance equipment about three years ago and implemented it. And it works great, but I have some, well, I had some notes, I think I can remember. If anybody's thinking of doing this sort of thing, you really need to have some more support in place. Just having the equipment and the classrooms and the connections there is not enough. We don't have uh, materials in the classroom. The students are restricted to coming to my classroom for a lab to once a month by their principals. Now, I, every year I beg the principals for, oh no, they have to have spirit week, and then they have to have their holidays, and all this stuff that we can only afford. So that in itself is a big problem. Two, having material packages to send out to the schools for them to use, you know, and I could do guided experiments where they would be doing it in the classroom, but still that's difficult because we don't have a, the schools do not support me actually, it all comes from the vocational school, and uh, that's what's been hard for me is trying to get the other schools to invest in it more. In other words, to have some things for their students there in place, not to depend on the once a month visit to my class. I'll admit, they come for about three hours and we can get maybe two good lab exercises done or one lab exercise and demonstrations that I don't have individual equipment to do. But overall, you know, I really enjoy it. It's really difficult. and. Very difficult. Yes. Um, who 
anybody, I, we, we don't want to get too far off track on the virtual education. I think that's another piece that we may want to have a, a meeting about. But are any of our partners from, from some of our rural districts utilizing virtual? Are you getting content from other systems or sharing content from one high school with other high schools? As you can see, um, you know, just very close to Knoxville and Morgan County, we have significant issues with science teachers. I mean, Dr. Warren said there's, there's schools in, in that district that do not have a chemistry teacher or a physics teacher. And certainly many schools without physics teachers at all. So um, this, you know, I think in this global effort of, of STEM education in Tennessee, it's something that we need to address in terms of, of capacity building. And um, the, this is kind of a starting point in terms of connecting us and, and getting us together. One of the things we've learned from Dr. Warren is um, his delivery of content needs to be supported by a teacher at the other end who, who you are developing. We've talked a lot about um, building teacher capacity, developing teachers at the other end, at the receiving end. So maybe um, a chemistry teacher that's never taught physics um, is on the other end and learning along with Dr. Warren and, and building um, building that knowledge base and that content base. Well, that would be the dream. So. Because it's so, sometimes I found that there's no one in the class with us students. At the other end. Yes. Yeah. There's no one. And then they have control over the speakers yeah. and the volume and their microphones. And sometimes I'm teaching them think, gosh, they're being quiet. This is great. They've got their microphones turned off. They're not paying attention. This distance stuff needs to be really monitored, really treated like a real class. I think it's getting treated kind of like, oh, isn't this great? Here you go. But they're you getting know. credit for this class that they... Reluctantly. <laughs> no, but they're getting credit for it, but, you know, uh, as we all know, the good students are going to win out, no matter what, how difficult it is, usually. And, you know, I try to make sure that I provide all the standards and things for those students and everybody, but what I was going to say, I can't really remember. Oh, relating back to physics first. We just finally have started having PLC, professional learning groups, for our science teachers. We've been getting together, and we're trying to get this physics first, or at least the physical world concepts introduced as a beginning course, because I believe that it's the way to go. But I don't believe, I believe that it should just be the introductory physics course, and then, like you said, later on you could go into the honors and that's, advanced. That's more of what we do. We don't yeah. offer, you know, and I want to say that, and Frank taught with us, and, and uh, you know, Frank and I kind of butt heads a lot and we work together, so we, you know, it's one of those where it's great to have him because we, you know, I can tell you the same thing. Great ideas going, but we also, you know, have conflicting things, and he likes to do the, the physics for credit, and, and I personally never really saw it going that way. Um, so we don't offer freshmen any physics credit. They get their lab science credit, one of the ones that they need, but they're not getting a physics credit from us. They're getting an introductory level physics course that we're looking at even trying to, to scale back a little bit more as far as, you know, Dr. Ellis was talking about breadth versus depth. We want depth more than breadth. We're trying to get those kids deeper to the understanding level, to the explanation, to, you know, some of the things in the modeling construct, being able to understand and explain and apply analyze, produce, those are the those are the things that we're trying to get them to. So um, Frank has taken his LNN, so I don't want you guys sitting in here to think that LNN PWC is the same as the Harvard Valley PWC because it's not. They're very, they're, they're are different. I have a question about what you're talking about there with this depth and, and breadth. I'm thinking about going forward with the park standards and I know that you know there'll be a lot of those kinds of questions for physics. Sure. And so, will your PW, will your PWC kids get the physics exam that will probably, from the park perspective, be written for kids that are juniors or? No, they will not. I, I, that is not in the works. Um, I just heard a piece of lingo I haven't heard before. Park. Oh, I, mean, I can't tell you what the acronym is. So, um, Mrs. So, so Ash, what is what is park? What's it stand for? It is Partnership for Assessment and Research. One of the C's is, the last C is Consortium. I forget what the first one is. It's two, it's P-A-R-C-C. -C, Partnership for Assessment and Research, something consortium. And, and so, yeah, the, the assessments, instead of being, um, you know, what's two times three, it's you have two kids, each one wants three cookies, 
what, uh, you know, how many cookies should you buy? And Joe says you need seven cookies. Why is he wrong? And that's the question. Right, so it's an approach be. to assessment rather yeah. that, 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 that goes to data. Right, so, so my thinking is like, so I, I kind of understand where I think the physics kind of questions are headed. And they're, you know, going to be written for what's sort of the traditional progression, which means that physics students will be juniors or seniors. And I was asking, you know, so do, I would have a concern about having a freshman take the park kind of questions that are written for juniors or seniors just because of the development. Can yeah. I talk about some of the benefits to chemistry and biology? Because I think that may address your question. Oh, yeah. um, I used to teach at West High School. West High School before I went to Hard Valley Academy. So very good high school, awesome students that I got in class. Um, but some of the differences that I have seen at Hardin Valley, and these are all a result of the freshman first, um, they have a much better understanding of graphing, where I used to have to teach them how to graph, and I used to have to teach them how to interpret graphs. I can now discuss the graph with them, where before I was not able to do that. In terms of um, formulas that are used, they understand that the variables in formulas have meaning, and that each of those particular variable symbols represent something. When they took biology first, they would just guess. They would throw out all sorts of junk, and I used to have to give them quizzes to get them to, un even in AP, to get them to understand that these variable symbols mean something, and if you understand that, you can do all sorts of things because you understand the meaning of the formula that you've been given. They get that now as a result of PWC, so then I'm able to talk about relationships. Right, which is um, what the park is going to Yes, right. exactly. Definitely going to be better for... Um, lab analysis. Um, and now, one of the things we do at Hardin Valley is we have a common format for how they will do lab reports. And that starts with the freshmen and goes all the way up through seniors. But when I teach them how to analyze what has happened in a lab, and especially like at the AP level or even with Honors One, to talk about how these parts of this formula have been affected by errors that you have made in lab, they are able to go with me on that. Before, they had absolutely no idea. I had to like write out <laughs> the, the phrases and how they would explain it, and they get it. Um, the other thing is I think they have a deeper understanding of interactions in nature. So um, because, so when I start, talk about things at the particulate level, um, I'm able to go much deeper there than I ever was when biology was taught first. Um, in terms of energy, because they've been introduced to thermodynamics in PWC, I can go much deeper in terms of energy. And um, the biology teachers have said because of that kind of progression from thermodynamics in PWC to energy relationships in chemistry, um, they can go all sorts of places once they get to biology. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, in fact, the AP biology teacher said, this is what she wrote to me, having students that have heard the laws of thermodynamics before is exhilarating and allows me to focus on application. Um, Any other testimonials? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the understanding of forces that they get in PWC translates beautifully into chemistry. So when we talk about forces of attraction between molecules, between atoms, they understand forces large scale in terms of things that they can see and touch and feel. And so now we're going to chemistry with stuff that they can't see, but they understand that those forces exist. And they've got a point of reference that they didn't have before. Um, their questions are better. And I think that's because they have a basic understanding of the world that they didn't before when they started with just biology. So I think each subsequent level benefits. Um, we have also seen a significant impact on our science ACT scores. So if we looked at um, the students who we had as juniors our first year that we were open who did not have physics first as freshmen or PWC as freshmen, um, to our first cohort of students who went through 
you know, that reverse, that inverse order, um, the science HCT scores jumped by nearly four points. And I, we feel very strongly that that is, that's because of that freshman, that PWC course. Um, and that's all. I mean, that wasn't, that was all students at our school ACT scores. It wasn't like we were just looking at the top kids. Um, you know, I think I was talking to Dr. Elston earlier, and we've got a ton of, a ton, I don't know, a lot of students who um, are pursuing engineering degrees and engineering careers. And I don't think that we would have as many students who were doing that if they had not been introduced to physics as freshmen, because you know that most of them who go through the traditional order don't take physics, you know. Um, once they're done, they're done. But this way, almost every student at the school gets introduced to it, and then they follow with chemistry, and then they follow with biology. And so we found, you know, our enrollment for physics courses, because um, we offer both AP Physics C and Physics B, we have at least 15 students in each of those classes, and we offer it every single year. And I don't think that would happen without the freshman course. Yeah. Um, looking into the future with next generation science standards, the cross-cutting concept, I mean, I see all of those fundamentally as physics. You know, physics, if, if the student learns these cross-cutting concepts in physics first, then you can apply them in the later disciplines. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, patterns, cause and effect, um, systems and models, um, um, energy, matter, structure and function, stability and change, and then um, as far as PWC supports the um, students learning of algebra in um, the early years, you know, scale, proportion, and quantity. That's one of the cross-cutting concepts. And so um, the students learning uh, how to visualize data graphically, how to interpret graphs, uh, as well as how to uh, think in terms of proportion, how to think about density as a ratio. Um, all of those are powerful concepts that PwC reinforces. So I think PwC, um, it, it, it is perfectly aligned with next generation uh, standards. You know, one, one other thing, uh, when, I, when I was going to, when I was getting ready to teach my first physics course, I talked to Dr. Elst, and I said, what do you want to see in your incoming freshmen? And he said, he kind of pulled at his hair a little bit and said, Teach them how to graph, you know, they don't know how to graph. And the interesting thing is that, you know, that modeling is extremely graphically intense. So, so that's how it is cross-cutting concept, and it probably is what is helping us in other areas. And uh, in just about everything we do in modeling is a graph. And another sidelight is that, um, since I've come to the school, I've started to use what's called the FCI, Force Concept Inventory, and I've done that. Uh, I've done that in the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. And I'm right now. I have students that are uh, taking the FCI, and they have shown such dramatic changes in their conceptual understanding of physics that it's remarkable. And um, and they're, uh, they're showing scores that are compatible with the original uh, data that was for you know, college level uh, students on their conceptual understanding. Now, you know, and, and, that's, and that's, now I've been teaching almost exclusively honors students this year, but, uh, but it's just kind of amazing how when you put a yardstick on it, it's, it's a really big deal. Marilyn, yeah. w wonder if our panel, because obviously we have a wealth of information, wonder if the panel would be willing to take a little quiz and provide us with the results. If, for those folks who are considering initiating this, this idea, what would each of you say would be the, the first three things to consider? And, and write it down, and then we'll see if how, you know, there's no, if we 
no, there's no correct answer. We, we're, we're interested, and, and, and Dr. Warren can play along as well, because he's thinking about it. And a lot of people are thinking about it. And Maryland's thinking about it for, for a stem spar. When you say consider, do you mean as in the whole picture overhead, or are you talking about just curriculum and learning? If, if you're establishing this curriculum, what's and what would be the, the first three things you think about doing to make it successful? Everything Debbie said is backed up everything everything Ms. Ash has ever said to us concern, you know, concerning this type of approach. And, and she's the well to say. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that would be a, a good wrap-up question. I'm, I'm, um, I know folks are at limited time, so let's let's talk about that, and then um, uh, we have a little survey to do with you all before everybody disappears, um, and we have school tours offered for those that would like to do that. But this would be a great great thought to end with: is is if this has intrigued you, and you'd like to go back to your base system and talk about it with other teachers or other administrators. Um, for those who have done it, um, Dr. Alston included, what would be three things that you would um, consider um, important? What would be the top three things that, that you would consider? Dr. Kelly, do you want them to, to um, just all report out? Or? Yeah, after, after they get, we've given them two minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> A minute to think about it. While they're doing that, Mrs. Ash, do you want to come up and say hello since we're recording this? and? Um, talk a little bit about the school tours. We'll probably be a little early for that, and I don't know how many will want to stay. I think today's early release Wednesday, so I forgot we were ahead anyway. You're ahead anyway. Yeah, right, go ahead. ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry I wasn't here first thing this morning to greet you. Um, we, being a platform school, we're also um, uh, part of the hub, and the external hub evaluator visit was yesterday and today, so I was with her this morning, um, but I knew you were in good hands. Welcome to our campus if you haven't been here before. And I think our, our teachers have represented to you well some of the unique characteristics, including our schedule, the modified AB uh, schedule, the, the way we do science. We also um, require our students, all students here take two years of Latin. So um, that's a, a, co a co requisite along with the science because it's all about thinking and Latin trains the brain to think deductively. And one of the things that was um, brought up, in, uh, I know Debbie mentioned the, the ACT science reasoning, that's another reason that we split the curriculum. Um, when you're talking about PARC, you know, one of the hallmarks of PARC is that it's actually two assessments per year per subject, and the first one is a, con a problem-based scenario, so it's very heavy constructed response, and the skills that you heard being taught in every class represented up here is exactly what PARC is after. Um, then the second part of it is the multiple choice, but even the multiple choice is at a deeper level. So um, when you look at the newly published Next Generation Science Standards, inverted curriculum is really the only sequence that makes sense because the, um, NGSS calls for science instead of to be, being taught mile wide and inch deep, we're drilling down. And we're drilling down not into the content because science content, like all other contents being studied, changes, is dynamic and ever evolving. So what we want to emphasize are the thinking skills and practices. This arrangement of classes allows that to happen, and that's one of the things that characterizes our curriculum across the board. Um, I would also point out one of the things, and you might already know this, I apologize if it's redundant. Um, when Hardin Valley opened, I had a different job. I was actually the science supervisor for the system at that time. And I remember going out and having to um, do presentations to parent groups who were registering their freshmen for the first time and explain why we were recommending the inverted curriculum. And um, most arguments that we brought up, like, you know, research tells us this should let them score higher on the ACT. You'd think that would encourage a parent. Nah, that's, well, that's nice, but I still want them to have biology first. Because think about it. Most parents that of kids now came up in that time period. Remember when the typical high school sequence with biology was for the smart kids as freshmen, and general or physical science was what the ones who weren't ready for biology went to? That's where the parents' heads are. So we, we use the ACT argument. I talk to them about, if you talk to anybody in science, they'll tell you that the concepts of physics, if you understand, you don't have to know the equations, but if you understand the rules of motion and why things behave the way they do, 
then chemistry makes sense, and bonding and angles all of a sudden make sense, and you get to biology, and if you put the evidence in front of the kids that Watson and Crick gathered, they'll come up with a double helix on their own as, well, what other shape would DNA be? So, because they understand everything before it. And the parents are like, well, that's nice, but, you know. So then, the last argument I gave them was, in 1899, the American Association of Colleges and Universities published a work to disseminate to K-12 systems across the nation. And it was a recommendation of courses for students to be prepared for college level work. And in that, they said, in the sciences, students should have a diverse preparation, including biology, chemistry, and physics classes. Well, what order is that, biology, chemistry, physics? Alphabetical, okay? It didn't say in this sequence, in this order, they just listed them alphabetically. <laughs> well, it got interpreted by the whoever was making decisions at that point. That was the sequence. That, and you, you go back, do all the research you want. I spent weeks researching, trying to find another reason. And that I actually kept getting pointed back to the same document over and over. And when you read the document, that's what it is. So biology, chemistry, physics, it's al alphabetical. It doesn't make sense um, curriculum-wise. That was when they finally went, oh. So um, that's how we convinced them. And I think if you go to talk to parents now out there, they wouldn't have it any other way. And um, it's one of those things, I think the biggest uh, drawback is, yeah, you've got to have somebody who knows chemistry, uh, or is certified in chemistry or physics to teach physical world concepts. But that's one of the things, you know, being part of the hub, that's one of the ways that we can work together as a network to support each other, whether it's the teacher training. Um, I know Dr. Elston is a master at getting people past the physics practice. He's done it for um, Knox County teachers. He's done uh, PD in the summer with our middle school uh, science teachers teaching the physical science concepts. I know Pellissippi has teacher ed preparation programs that do the same thing. So there are ways to reach out. I know Walter State and Run State also do too, and they're also encompassed within our hub boundaries. So um, the, the supports are out there, and I think as a hub, that's one of the things that we can do is reach out, talk to each other, and I'm, I want to thank Marilyn for bringing it. I, I was impressed with the number of questions and the level of engagement. It's a hot topic, um, trying to figure out, and especially speaking from the principal's uh, perspective, um, it's a numbers game. And I know the principal school year sitting out there, you know, bottom line is I have to be <coughs> accountable to um, my, the parents in my community for the scores on those EOCs for my kids. So I don't want to set them up for failure. I don't want to look bad in the paper. And I want to be sure that my teachers are able to score on the team, Tiger, TAP, MAT, whatever evaluation model you're using. And you don't want to put them in uh, situations where they don't have the content knowledge. Again, we need to identify those needs, work together as a network to build that capacity among all of us. Um, and the other piece in that, too, is with Park coming online, you know, and it's, it's like that train, the light's off there in the distance, and it's headed towards us the spring of 2014, uh, 15, spring of 2015, yeah. is when we'll have the first administration of Park. And if you've been to any of the Common Core training that the state put out, they're serious with the level being kicked up. Um, when you look at the test items. And on one hand, I know as an educator that excites me because I'm thinking, now I've got teeth. This is why we go deeper because we're getting them ready for this instead of um, just letting teachers or students be the ones say, I don't need to know that much. The TCAP is written at this level. So it's a move in the right direction and it's going to hurt, but we need to rip the mandate off and, and go on and help each other heal and move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you when you uh, take tour of the building. Um, some, some credit to uh, John Campbell, who's with us today from Alcoa City Schools. He dug in a little bit, um, just, just kind of scratched the surface, but I've got a couple of slides that I'll post to our website this afternoon um, that has some research. I've, I've put this slide up here um, with various um, physics uh, associations and societies and um, also a couple of peer-reviewed journal articles where, where folks have this in practice. So if you want to go back to your base district and, and read a little bit more about this and see what's out there in the research. Um, as Dr. Elson said at the beginning, the interesting thing is this, this has been around for a while. 
Um, it just hasn't necessarily caught caught fire um, in Tennessee or, or in East Tennessee, but um, there seems to be a lot of good reasons both in the data and as you've heard here from some folks that are in the trenches with it in general practice. Um, let's get through and hear your top three and then um, we'll wrap up. Debbie, what should we think about? Um, you need buy-in. You've got to talk people into doing it. Um, you need people who are committed to it, and that includes your teachers and your administration, because this is not something you're going to be able to just implement one year and see the benefits of. It's something that you need to stick with for a while. So I kind of put that together. Um, collaboration among teachers, um, and <coughs> include the math teachers in that, and then training. Right. Um, everything I could think of could really be umbrellaed under collaboration. Um, like at the beginning of this year, I was co-teaching with six other teachers, and that was intense. And it was very good for me where I was. And um, I think collaboration among teachers as far as with math teachers, so the physics teacher needs to be working with math to reinforce each other but also the science teachers need to be working together because the whole point of putting physics first is that it supports the later disciplines. So everyone needs to be talking with each other latitudinally and longitudinally. Right. Well, we, Rudy and I figured out we're clones. Uh, um, the, uh, um, the, the number one on my list would be training and modeling. Um, this, I think that's the, how you're going to get the graphical part of this puzzle together. Uh, number two would be you need sufficient amount of equipment for them to actually put their hands on something. Um, now, if you don't have that, there is a way to do it. It's called ILD, Interactive Lecture Demonstration. And I do it quite a bit in optics where you can't put really high quality equipment in the hands of, of someone that you wouldn't want near your car. Uh, so, uh, so the idea is that you can you can give them um, you can go through an experiment and ask them to predict what's going to happen and so ILDs work pretty well I, optics works great for me since I have the other equipment um, and so you need it even if you're going to do distance you've got to have the equipment in their hands otherwise I mean what are they going to do I mean how are they going to even take friction measurements or Anything? How are they going to do any of that kind of thing? I do most of that all on the screen. Yeah. It's not satisfying. Yeah. I can put myself in the students, pretend they're like, well, he's doing it all. Yeah. You know, this isn't any fun. Well, they're the, not really having any fun. You know, Dr. Sokoloff over in uh, over in Washington State has a really. Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, uh, I saw him speak. Uh, and he really has this down pat. He's done this for, he's got units in just about everything, but, you know, he can do a lecture demonstration and basically the kids have a modified worksheet in front of them where they have to predict what's going to happen. It, you know, when you pull an object, um, after, um, after the object starts moving, will it, take more or less force than, you know, and they'd have to make that prediction than when it was just sitting still before it broke free. So um, you can, if you can get them to make that kind of connection, that's good, but it's, you can't really replace putting equipment in their hands. It doesn't have to be real expensive equipment. I think the CPO equipment is just unbelievable, Rudy and I um, uh, may agree, but I don't think Rudy's doing any ventriloquist stuff, um, and commitment, and uh, from the administration and from the parents, and I, Debbie and I agree, um, when I was at Hardin Valley, my lines of parents and Rudy's would extend out the door, the front door, in this big room, and, um, and it would be, every question would it be, they wouldn't even listen to the previous question, it would be, come up to you and say, I was looking for the book for this course, and... Uh, well, there isn't in modeling. You kind of make, you know, you're doing experiments and they are doing it. So the parent wants a book. Um, so we went to uh, Hewitt's book over uh, at uh, 
Hardin Valley, and uh, and we have it here too. But it's kind of a decoration on the wall that we look at every once in a while, and um, we don't really use the book. Um, I have it online for certain aspects of the course, but but you know parents don't understand that, and then they go, well. My daughter said that she came in Monday and you did an experiment, they did an experiment, and I don't understand, why didn't they get information before that? Well, that's not the teaching. The teaching sequence is this. And, you know, after you went through one of those things, your lines were shorter and shorter, and, and, um, and there were, uh, and also they, they would get very upset to begin with, but then after it was explained to them, then it was just no problem. It was like nothing ever happened. So, so you've got to you're going to go through a little bit of pain as you're getting it started, and then the second year will probably be you know much better because they'll they'll have heard from other people, and then probably now you're probably not even getting one. Well, year five, they say I don't want him. I want to move the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard because you're making them think. In front of mind, that class is hard. No, it's not hard. I'm just making you do things that you're not exercising a muscle we're not used to using, uh, which is called your brain. Uh, my number one same thing as his was use of modeling teaching. Okay, so the training that comes along with it. My second one has already been is PLC or, or uh, collaborative groups to aid and support the teachers that are teaching it. Um, one of the problems that you know uh, Ms. Sayers talked about in the first year, every science teacher took it. That hard back. The problem with that was. The first year at Hard Valley was sink or swim for every teacher because everybody was new to the building. There were no procedures for anything. So it was here's a key, here's a class full of kids, no books, no equipment, no nothing, teach them. So it was literally leave me alone and let me do my thing and then we'll come back and talk about it later. Um, and it really was, you know, here's the fire, go. Uh, it's getting better. We still don't have that PLC support for the physics first in our school. It's literally myself, um, and it was Frank, and it was another teacher, Michael Hartman. It was three of us collaborating to teach, you know, 400, 300 kids. Uh, that, and there are more teachers teaching it than that, and those teachers aren't comfortable with it. They don't like it. They, when they get told they're teaching PWC, they say, oh, not that class again. Instead of saying, yes, I'm excited about it, because they've not been through some of the modeling things. So what I see is the teachers that don't like it are the teachers that have not been trained in modeling. Teachers that love it are the ones that have been trained in modeling. It is very modeling friendly. So if you, if you get, to me the two almost have to go together. Um, the book is true. They'll want a book. I need a book. I need a book. I need a book. And there's, okay, here's a book. And at the end of the semester, let's collect the book. And they're in the exact condition that you gave them out. Oh. Because the kids don't have to open them. Because everything we do that was in the book that they were read, we did. And then we made sense of it. And now they're like, oh, well, we didn't really need the book. Some kids just want a book. I have one online. I have an online textbook. Why don't you use that? No, I need a book. Okay, here's your paperweight. You know, you're going to carry this around in your backpack all semester. It's a big book. Here you go. Um, you don't need a book to teach this class. You just need the equipment. Um, which is my third one, which is commitment, interest, support by the administration so you can buy the equipment. Um, so when you say, I need the equipment, they don't say, well, what do you need that for? Um, it's a buy-in from the top. You know, it's not often that an administrator comes to you and says, hey, I found you $1,000 to spend when you want. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, and this happens regularly at our school. You know, one of the first teachers they come to and they find money is, is the physics department. Hey, what do you guys need? We're, we're ready to support you some more. What else do you need? And I think the fact that the four of us are sitting up here is, you know, we, we want to help and aid in and get that started with, with in more schools in this room. Dr. Allison. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll let Dr. Alston finish up. You can be our, top, wrap everything up. Rocky, and my number one mean? was money. Y'all keep saying equipment and things like that. When you don't have the money, you can't buy the equipment. Mm -hmm. I dream of getting the stuff y'all probably would throw away. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my second one is buy-in for the administration. And my third one is Better education in language. Uh, I, I took four years of Latin at Bearden. Helped me through my whole life. You know, I think teaching Latin like y'all are doing is great. A great idea. You know, but also 
You know, I've, I've read Aaron's book, The Introductory to Physics Teaching, and Aaron talks about the, a lot of the basic English and semantic concepts that children do not get and must have. And I would imagine that physical world concepts introduces them to a lot of this if they haven't had it before. So they aren't walking into chemistry or physics, and I say, you know, simultaneously or, you know, uh, inverted. <laughs> and not only that, but conjunctions and things like that of better, not only cooperation with English, with math teachers, but also with English teachers. That's to be a lot of collaboration among the faculty, it sounds like, to, to make this work. Um, Dr. Thank Austin, you. your, your thoughts and maybe wrap us up here? Uh, I don't know about wrapping up. I'm mean, not sure, um, not exactly a tidy package. Um, well, my three question or uh, three things to think about were uh, sort of echoed by the things people have said. How will you pitch this to your stakeholders? It's probably the most important thing, I think. Uh, how will you develop your teachers to successfully deliver a program of this kind? Uh, the one I didn't hear a lot about is how will you assess uh, what how this program works? I have not heard a lot about that. Um, and I think I, I have the impression that, at least at your level of the educational system, a lot of how you assess is sort of imposed on you, maybe? Uh, yeah. and, and so um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, how, how that issue comes out in the end. Um, but I'm really interested in what I've heard today uh, I'm encouraged by it very much because maybe some of the students that arrive in my classroom will be much better prepared than the ones who are writing today. Um, the um, issue, the, the, the uh, feature of this that um, Debbie raised about students having a better appreciation of there being relationships between the entities that are involved in science in terms of symbolic quantities. And that's something my students in my classroom, ones I get, don't seem to have any appreciation for at all. If I start talking about a, a symbolic quantity, something like velocity, and I'm doing it in the context of a problem that we're considering, the first thing my students want to do is have a number that they can put in their calculator. They do not want to hold the concept in abeyance while they think about the rest of the problem. It, just, it has to be immediate for them, and that's that's a real problem for teaching physics or any other area of science. I think is the, uh, is, is the uh, need to be able to think symbolically. That's um, about all I. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for coming today, and thank you so much to our panelists. We're going to wrap up with a, a survey and optional school tours, um, and Dr. Kelly has, has a closing thought, and then we'll invite Mrs. Ash to come up, and um, maybe Dr. Kelly can help pass out the iPads as well. Yes, one more question, because, okay, so, so the panel starts, and they've got to do, and then you've got the point, you got to get the buying. But the folks that are sitting out here, or Maryland will be talking to in the future, thinking about this, how important would it have been for, say in Rudy's case, fellow faculty, parents, friends of the family, anybody that wanted to, administration, to see physics first demonstrated one way or another, STEM Spark probably has an opportunity for a next year or so to perhaps make this available, what's happening at the LNN, we're working on it, making that available to be seen remotely live, would that be beneficial to get the buy-in? Absolutely. I think, you know, and that's this semester, I did not have a chance to 
open house was canceled for some reason this this semester, and my parents and kids are confused the whole semester because they don't understand what we're doing. Um, in semesters where I've had the open house and was able to inform them, like Frank said, of how it goes, no questions. Everything's good to go. Everybody, the parents understand when you say real life application, and they understand that I'm not teaching your child facts out of a book. I'm teaching your child how to do something, think for themselves, solve problems, apply it to a new situation. They appreciate that. They they understand it. And they get it. Uh, but if you don't have that opportunity to explain yourself, uh, there is a you got some explaining to do. Where are my child's grades? At 70, my child's always been an A student. Yeah, when you're regurgitating facts, your child's great at it. But as far as applying the knowledge they've learned, they've got some work to do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Marilyn, what are you going to, you said you're going to post. Um, I'm going to post.